I'm not really that excited about the way you're doing ministry. I said, okay, in what way aren't you excited? She says, well, we have a lot of younger people that are coming in. I said, well, okay, that's fine. And she says, well, no, it's not. We didn't start this church. This church was not started to have young people. This is a retirement or, yes. Yeah, I know. And I knew it wasn't, see. And, and, uh, and you probably have an idea who may have said that. And the thing, and uh, and I said, so why wouldn't you want young families to come in? and be a part of the church. Well, I'm not against them coming in, but I don't want them to be members of the church. So why don't you want them to be members of the church? Well, because then they'll start taking over. And I, and I said, well, that can be a good thing sometimes. And so everything that she brought up, I had an answer for. And the thing was, I finally said, you know, God has called me here to minister to this community. But this community, she said, is a senior citizen community. I said, well, we have four families that are coming to the church, and none of them are senior citizens. Well, that, she says, that's the kind of people I'm talking about. <laughs> See? And... From that time on, and my wife can tell you, because I, she probably remembers me mentioning that to her. And from that time on, that woman and her hubby and some others kind of took up stones where, whereby they might slay me. And it, did, and it never really happened uh, the way that she wanted. And so bottom line was they wound up starting another church. Sad, yeah. Um, I certainly don't mean this anywhere near as irreverent as it might sound, but I think this will resonate with a good share of us. Anybody that's been hanging around this church or any church for a long time and doing their best and trying to keep things going and all that, instead of going, they'll take over, where <laughs> we'd be going, oh, please. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and see, that's, that's where envy comes into play is when we, we, we feel threatened by a particular position that we have. Yes? I would just like to interject that as much as we laugh about this and think we could never do that, I know with myself, I mean, out at the We Out Church, you know, when different music styles started yeah. coming in, different this, different that. We all have those little yeah. Yeah. things that we that are just as detrimental. Yeah, yeah. And it's difficult. All of us, all of us are prone to be envious in one in one area or another, in one way or another. And so by nature, we are proud and we want to be, we may not admit it sometimes, but we want to be applauded and recognized and it's like we uh, we carry a sign around on us that says please realize that I'm around please take note that I'm around and and from childhood we we've been uh, taught to compete with others Carol is it it doesn't uh, let me rephrase that is it inherently wrong well, no. be, I think we all want to be yeah. recognized. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, a, and it's, it's when, we, when we carry that to the extreme that if for some reason uh, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be uh, noticed and accepted. Where, where, the wrong, where the wrong comes in is when we go overboard to make that happen. If someone doesn't say hello to us, you don't know how many times down through the years I as a pastor and a leader 
have someone who said, you know what, I passed you at the mall last week and you didn't even say hello to me. And of course, I can be a wise guy at times. And, and, I, and I, sometimes I'll say, so if you saw me, how come you didn't come and say something to me? Well, I know that you saw me and you didn't say anything to me. And I'll say, you know, I really didn't see you. Well, I don't know how you couldn't see me. The mall wasn't that crowded. And see, then it escalates from there. And that's what I'm talking about, where, where we just have to be noticed. We have to be noticed. Otherwise, we have a bad day. We have a bad day. And then everybody's against us. Everybody's against us. Yeah. What's the scripture? I don't know where it's at, but what's the, what's the scripture? The right hand shouldn't know what the left hand is doing. Oh. Is that more like in service? You shouldn't care whether you're being. Yeah, it's <clears throat> that that scripture is several places in in the book of Proverbs, and I think sometimes in the Psalms. But yeah, that's it. We where uh, <clears throat> we don't need to keep score. Yeah, yeah. Pardon? Yeah, the proverb that I started off with was um, a sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. And the envy that it's talking about is, is the bad part of being envious. And envy can very easily lead to anger. And then anger, listen to this now, anger is often the first step toward murder. They're really trying to analyze this situation that took place in Texas this week where a total of 10 people wound up being killed. And initially they said they never they never would have believed it was this young man, 17-year-old kid. But then someone came out and said, but he had a very angry streak that could sometimes morph out of control. And then they began to check that avenue out. And they discovered that the times weren't, weren't that isolated in this young man's life, going back a lot of years, where he was angry. And it doesn't necessarily, the, the posts that I read didn't say that much about envy, but they sure did about he got angry. And, you, and we get guys that come into the program at the mission, and they just have, they're, they're angry. See? And, and in my position as chaplain, I can get to the guts of stuff and ask some hard questions that maybe Brian or the house managers don't feel comfortable asking. And I'll say, so let's back this up. You seem to, to have you know, obsessed by some anger. When did it all start? Well, you know, when I was in school, they cut me from the basketball team. And I was better. And here's what's interesting. And I was better than Fred Jones. They not only remember that they were better than somebody else, but they remember the name. See? And then, then they have this deep-seated envy, and then it morphs into, into anger. And then eventually can be that first step to murder. And so this explains why King Saul, through his spirit, young David, we finished up with this part last week, while David was trying to soothe the king, and help him overcome depression. And David was reaching out to him as his servant, wanting to help him. And, and so he, he, he was trying to soothe him by playing on the harp uh, to help uh, him overcome his depression. And the Lord enabled David to escape. And when David returned to the king a second time, remember in those early 
early times, David would go back and forth, and then there came a, came a time when he was there permanently, but not necessarily by the king's side permanently. And David, had, when, the, when the King Saul hurled a spear at him, David escaped, went back a second time, hoping that maybe Saul had calmed down, but Saul tried to kill him again. So let me read uh, chapter 18, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. Then Saul was very angry, and this was at the point where the, when, when uh, David would come in after a battle, and the women, it said, the women would, 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 say, would sing, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And, and this was probably just a hyperbole. Saul probably hadn't killed ten thousands, and, and, and David probably hadn't killed ten thousands. But the thing was, this is what they sang. And so it says, Saul was very angry. And the saying displeased him, and he said, They've ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul is thinking, David's going to get puffed up here, and he's going to want to become king. Saul did not know yet that he had been rejected by God as king, and that David, in fact, was, uh, had already been anointed to be king. So then Saul eyed David from that day forward. Or Saul probably, how many times in your lifetime over the last few years have you had somebody go? I have guys at the mission. They'll go, Tommy. And I'll go like this. <laughs> and it happened. On the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, he prophesied inside the house. We mentioned last week that this word prophesied is actually rave. He raved. And he, so David played music with his hand, as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. And then, so that's, that's what we have there. And the Lord protected David from Saul's murderous hand and a fact that frightened Saul even more. Notice what in verse 15 it says, Therefore, when Saul, Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, talking about David, he was afraid of him. And then drop down to 20, verse 29 in this same 18th chapter. And it says, And Saul, and Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. So, whew, things aren't going to get better. Saul was fighting a losing battle. Got to keep that in mind. Saul was fighting a losing battle in going up against David. Because, you see, God was on David's side, but God had departed from Saul. Notice verse 12. Now Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Had departed from Saul. Uh, I was reminded again as I put this stuff together about uh, Saul was fighting a losing battle and going up against David, reminded of the New Testament verse says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Psalm 37. Read that sometimes. Fret not. Keep. Two key words mentioned many times in the 37th Psalm. Fret not, fret not, fret not. And we have a tendency when, when uh, Satan, our enemy, or his, his uh, uh, angels or his emissaries, his, his people, get after us. And we want to shake in our boots. But what we need to realize, if God be for us, who can be against us? Two or three, several of the guys, more than two or three, several of the guys in the two, close to three years I've been at the mission now have said that when they reach a point where they can get out away from the mission, either with somebody or on their own, that one of the verses that they say constantly, if they see somebody that they used to run with and do drugs with and stuff like that, or, or they're coming across places, you know, they're, they're walking and, there's a place up here where they used to go and do drugs or buy alcohol or whatever, and, and, and they'll say, 
as they're walking, they'll go, if God be for me, who can be against me? If God be for me, who can be against me? And then they'll come back and they'll tell me and, and they'll victoriously say, I, I did it. I did it. See, my little, we got, I, I got four great grandsons and, and Kyler, the one that's closest and lives there in Portuna. Um, Kyler does something and he'll go, I did it. See, and that's what some of those guys come back and they'll say, I did it. I went up the same street where I used to go on my way to the courthouse or something like that, and I ran into some of the same people, and I was not influenced by anything they did, were doing, or anything that I saw. I did it. I'm victorious. So, possessed by anger and envy, and determined to continue to be king, Saul decides now that young David had to be killed. Wow. And just, just shortly before that, the scripture says that, in so many words, Saul had cashed in with Jonathan. Scripture says, uh, Jonathan loved David. And Saul pretty much said the same thing. And Saul loved David and brought him into his service. But he, when, when he went out to do battle, and he came back, and the ladies sang, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. Even though it was an exaggeration, like we mentioned last week, it cut to the heart of Saul. And he could not handle it. He could not handle it. I remember a time when I <coughs> was in the car business in Eureka. I was a sales supervisor, making good money, making good money for the dealership. And, but they needed somebody out on the sales floor. And I had done a good job out on the sales floor before I got promoted to sales supervisor and had an office. And I very rarely had to get into the nitty gritty stuff. I was just kind of the, what they called the closer. And I'd go in there and I'd just kind of close the deal. That's what I was good at when I just was, was a salesman, so-called. And so as a supervisor, I went, I'd go in there and close the deal. Well, they needed somebody out on the floor to do the stuff from start to finish. So they put me out on the floor, back out on the floor, and I thought, okay, that's good. I could make more money. And, <clears throat> and then the person that they hired in my position as sales supervisor had absolutely no experience selling cars. His job, he worked for household finance selling money. But he didn't sell cars. He didn't know anything about selling cars. And so he becomes my supervisor. And the first thing he does, he wants me to do a walk around of a car. And one of the thing is, when I would do that with the other salesmen to see how well they knew their merchandise, I had this little clipboard, a tiny clipboard, and, and I'd, I'd critique them. And so this fellow, Ron, he comes out, and I could, I could just picture in my mind him critiquing me. And I said, I'm not going to do that. And he says, you got to do it. I says, no, I don't. He says, well, why don't you want to do it? I said, because I know more about all this stuff than you do, and I can't figure out, and I don't like it that you're in my job. He says, this is not your job. It's my job now. And it wasn't until a general manager threatened to fire me that I went out there and reluctantly did a walk around. And I did a perfect walk around, and he picked me to part. And finally, I said, you know what? I don't want to do this again with you. Please don't ask me to do it again. And he never did ask me to do it again. But I think he accomplished his purpose by letting me know that he was a boss. And I felt in my heart that I accomplished my purpose by letting him know that he wasn't, not at least over me. 
But I had a lot of unrest, a lot of unrest. And uh, I think that's one of the times in my life where I was really envious because something had taken away from me that I really wanted. So Saul reaches a point where he says, this young man has to be killed. And so like we wound up last week, a statement we made was, what Saul couldn't do directly, he decided to try and do indirectly. And Saul promotes David to be captain over a thousand soldiers, hoping that <coughs> the Philistines would help get rid, of, get rid of him. David was an excellent soldier. He was a born leader. And the logical thing was to give him assignments that would take him away from the camp where the enemy could kill him. Saul says, I can't do it on my own. I'll get get the Philistines to do it. And if David was killed in battle, it was the enemy's fault. It wasn't, it wasn't Saul's fault. And if he lost a battle but lived, his popularity would wane. But the plan didn't work because David won all the battles. He went out to the battles against the Philistines and was not killed. He, ke he kept coming back Victorious? Why? Because the Lord was with him. Notice verse 13 of chapter 18. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence, made him his captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. In other words, they saw him going out to battle. They saw him coming back. And David behaved wisely in all his ways because the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Now, another thing that takes place when we get to the envious, angry, the envious and angry and murderous stage that King Saul had arrived at, we set aside, now listen closely, we set aside vows or agreements that we may have made before envy, anger, and the thought of murder took control. You got that? Remember this. Saul had promised to give one of his daughters in marriage to the man who killed Goliath. But this promise at this point had not yet been fulfilled. The fact that David had killed Goliath wasn't enough when it came right down to it, once Saul became envious, jealous, and thought about murder. For Saul now expected to David or David to fight the battles of the Lord in order to gain his wife. And the wife he was going to gain was Saul's oldest daughter, Marab. And listen to this now. The extreme that envy can take us. Saul wasn't beneath using his daughter as a tool to get rid of David. The details aren't totally given, but it seems that David had to fight a certain number of battles before the marriage could take place because we see there that there's kind of a uh, before the allotted time type thing. And of course, like we just mentioned, King Saul was hoping that David would be slain during one of those battles, and then Saul would lose his enemy but still have his daughter. David will be gone, out of my life, which I want, but I'll still have my daughter. However, David humbly declines the offer, saying that his family wasn't worthy to be related to the king, so Saul gave Merib to another individual. Hmm. Here's another thing about David. David could have looked Saul right in the eye and say, King Saul, I shouldn't have to go to battle to get the gal because you promised that I could have one of your daughters if I killed the giant. And I killed the giant. But he didn't do that. Notice verses 17, 18, and 19. Then Saul said to David, Here's my older daughter. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. So David said to Saul, 
Who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? Now, an interesting footnote, and we'll get to this when we get to it a while down the road. Merib and her husband would have five sons, and all of them, every one of them, would be sacrificed years later as an act of vengeance against Saul and to end the famine in the land. If you want to make a note and read it later, 2 Samuel <coughs> chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. And uh, very enlightened. You okay, Nancy? Okay. Okay. All right. Now, on the heels of Saul giving Merib to another man, Saul happily discovers, the scripture says, Saul was very glad that his younger daughter, Michal, or Michael, was in love with David. So he, he plots further. Notice verses 20 and 21. So Saul said, I will give her to him. Well, uh, Michal, or Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David, and so they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. He was happy. So he said, I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him. And that the land, hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, You shall be my son-in-law. Hmm. Once again, Saul approaches him. And, but this time, Saul selects servants to lie. And, and tell David how much Saul loves him. And, and how much he thinks of him and everything like that. But, but David... Put them, put them off. And he says something, but it's the truth. He was from a lowly family and didn't have any money to pay the bride, the bride price. And, and I, I made a note here. The bride price was uh, usually a sum of money paid by the prospective groom to the bride's parents, money or land or something like that. And that's laid down in the book of Exodus as part of the law. And typically such a bride price provided for the wife ahead of time in case the husband deserted her or died. And the amount of the bride price would be set by the parents of the bride and would reflect the status of the bride. And so David, being from a large, poor family, uh, would not have the financial means to enter into a royal marriage under Saul's perverted terms. Because he was taking, here's another thing where Saul violated, Saul violated the law of the, the bride price when he, when he says, uh, notice verses 22, 23, and 24. So Saul commanded his servants, communicate with David secretly and say, look, the king has delight in you and all his servants love you. Now therefore become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David. David said, uh, does it seem right to you a light thing to be as king's son-in-law, seeing I am a poor and lightly esteemed man? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, in this manner, David spoke. So David says, I can't afford, you know, and probably registered in David's mind again. I was going to get the bride for free. And now I got to pay. And I don't, have any, I don't have any money. I don't have any land. I'm poor. And then Saul says to David, and here we go. Saul is so obsessed with killing David that he tweaks the bride price requirement. Notice verse 25. Then David said, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry but 100 foreskins of the Philistines. Now, to the request for foreskins from the Philistines would prove that the victims were indeed Philistines. How? Right. Many of the other neighbors of Israel in the land practiced circumcision, but the Philistines did not. So that's why Saul would demand, demanded 100 foreskins of the Philistines. Now, 
Notice what David does. Verse 26. So when his servants told David these words, <laughs> I put down in my original notes when I was going through some time ago, making notes on this portion of scripture. I put, um, when, his, when his servants told David these words, David said, I got this. It pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Because David... I think in his mind was going back to all the times he was victorious over animals, over Goliath, over some of the Philistines already, and he thought, I can handle this. And so the, the days had not expired, so evidently there was a time limit. Therefore David arose and went, he and his men, and killed not 100, but 200 men of the Philistines. And he brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full count to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, as his wife. Now, the first part of verse 28 lets us know that Saul saw and knew that David was with the Lord, and the Lord was with David. Now pay close attention. King Saul could have stopped right then and there because it says he knew and saw that the Lord was with David. And King Saul could have stopped right then and there, repented of his envy, of his anger, of his murder plots, accepted his rejection by God, and come alongside David as a mentor and a fellow warrior. And they all live happily ever after. But he doesn't. He doesn't. And instead he becomes David's enemy. The Bible says in verse 29. Continually. There is always. An opportunity. To stop what we're doing. Repent. And turn around. And go in the direction that God has for us. Right? Right? And sometimes we get so caught up in what we want that we lose sight of the fact that we just need to stop it. We just need to stop it. One of our recent graduates, I mentioned a little bit about him last week, Mark Grimes, went off the rails shortly after he graduated. And he went out and got a place against the counsel of not only Brian but myself and others and one of the house managers happened to be talking to him uh, one night here a couple weeks ago and he noticed that Mark unusual for Mark his, his speech was kind of slurred and he said Mark I don't know what you're involved with but I feel you may not be living a life right now that's pleasing to the Lord. And whatever you're doing, you need to stop it. And Mark shared with me this week, he said, I could have just continued to do it. See? But he said, I didn't. I stopped what I was doing, got a hold of Brian. Brian says, get back to the mission, I'll give you a room get straightened out and let's start all over again and Mark says I'll even be willing to go through the program or part of it all over again but I want to get my life back straight the fifth wheel that he purchased he has it up for sale and the fellow he bought it from said if, if it's not sold pretty soon I'll give you your money back or at least most of it the trailer park that he put it in, under the circumstances, the people who own the park said, we'll cut your rent in half for, the, for the, this month and give you some of that money back. See, And so, <laughs> and Mark, who read most of the Bible while he was in the program, mentioned to me Thursday. He says, in, in the midst of all this, as I'm reading my Bible, he says, I come across this verse that says that God's going to restore what the locusts have ruined. 
And he said, I had a lot of locusts that just kind of swarmed in over the last several weeks. And God is restoring that. But you see, Saul did not allow restoration to take place. He never did the rest of his life. And he had plenty of warning. Okay. So next week, the murderous plot thickens even more. Because King Saul and Lys, get this, his own son, and then all of his own servants, Saul's own servants, to help him kill David. Hmm. Like I mentioned, envy, envy is a horrible thing. So whenever we see it raising its ugly head, and often envy can, is very ugly when it first takes root in us. Whenever it raises its ugly head, we need to stop it. Craig Parkinson, who shared here yesterday in the men's meeting, said, when made a statement, he says, I learned this a long time ago. When you get to hell, stop. And he simply expanded on that. And then Pastor expanded on it a little bit later too as well. That when we get to a point where hell seems to be engulfing us, like it did with Saul, like it did with Mark. We need to respond the way Mark Grimes did and say, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to go any further with this. Or we can respond the way that Saul did and said, you haven't seen anything yet. It's going to get worse. I'm going to make it worse. So God help us. God help us to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. Any questions or comments? What do you have, Pastor? Living stones. Living stones. Is that from Peter? I did it. No. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I, I want to thank you for the way you spoke to my heart, not only individually, but stuff that I can pass on to not only these folks, but others about this lesson today. That we can, we, we are able to, when, when things like envy and anger and even thoughts of murder uh, would, would want to come in and, and get a foot, foothold in our minds, we can say, I don't want that. I'm not going to go there. So help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.